So one of the remarkable things after the 2008 financial crisis was the supposed restoration of the financial system that we created in its aftermath actually just created and sowed the seeds for even worse in the future, not in the form of financial crises, but in the form of financial policies that permanently, I would say, gutted, or at least since then, ever since then, have gutted the essence of American capitalism itself. The first thing we did was we ushered in an era of easy money in this country, money raining from on high like mana from heaven from the Federal Reserve that was supposedly a, a short-term stopgap measure to pump liquidity into the markets on the back of the 08 crisis in the middle of that year became QE1 and then QE2 and then Operation God Knows What that actually continues year after year to create what really was a culture in this country that disincentivized work, that resulted in a maldistribution of wealth. You don't get trickle-down economics from Ronald Reagan's era when economic growth is really just driven by artificial paper being printed from the top, only planting the seeds for possibly the next financial crisis, which as we have this conversation today, may be you know, in the early stages of unfolding, in part because of self-inflicted behavior from the Federal Reserve on the back of the 2008 financial crisis. You saw the rise of the ESG movement, the politicization of capital markets, a sort of dowry that was paid for the arranged marriage between big business and government as effectively a price, a delayed price for the 2008 bailouts on the back of the 08 financial crisis. So what do we learn? We learned that these crises are occasions to actually plant the seeds for quite possibly far more damage done over a longer period of time that follows, but as a justification for a response to that crisis. So let's learn that lesson now as we enter the modern banking instability that we appear to be entering right now. What are we going to see on the back of potential bank failures in the United States, of brokered marriages between large banks absorbing small ones? We're having this conversation right on the back of the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. What I predict we're going to see is a march towards a new response or a new opportunity, really, seized by the federal government, as they did in the back of the 08 financial crisis, to see, for example, the advent of central bank digital currencies or CBDCs on a retail scale, saying that these small banks couldn't be trusted. We had to intermediate the system through big banks instead. Why not use the federal government that brokers those marriages to actually get its ultimate wish list, which is control over its citizenry, at a, in a way that ordinarily the citizenry wouldn't have stood for, but for the existence of a crisis that justified it. We learned that in 2008. I'm afraid we're learning that same lesson in the early stages of it right here in 2023. And today I'm joined in the podcast by a guest who understands a little bit of something about financial market regulation and even as it relates to the rise of cryptocurrency as a, let's just say, a competitive parallel system to the existing financial system, some of the risks that that poses, but possibly the opportunities as well. I'm looking forward to approaching today's conversation with an open mind. Uh, we don't know each other that well, but Lee, welcome to the podcast, and I want you to introduce yourself, and I'm looking forward to you know, to rolling up our sleeves and, and getting into it. So welcome to the podcast, Absolutely. introduce yourself, and, and tell me a little bit about your background and what got you interested in financial regulation and then more recently in crypto, and, and we'll go from there. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Vivek. It's, uh, it's good to be with you. So yeah, I mean, I've been at Duke now for almost seven years um, in a variety of roles, but I'm a lecturing fellow in the economics department and at the law school. Um, and so a lot of my work at Duke is around financial regulation and regulatory policy. Um, that's my background coming to, to, before coming to Duke. I worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, um, primarily as a bank examiner. So supervising uh, large, systemically important financial institutions, otherwise known as too big to fail um, institutions, certainly relevant to, to what's going on now because that you know uh, definition seems to be expanding. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, so... You know, I got into cryptocurrency uh, just as a curiosity uh, when I was at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, I think like a lot of people. Um, but then when I came to Duke, I had an opportunity to start teaching classes on um, fintech law and policy. Crypto was sort of a part of that course. But then as sort of crypto grew and the regulatory and policy issues grew with it, it was sort of taking up more and more of that course. So I just created a, a standalone crypto uh, law and policy course. So you know, very active um, in sort of crypto policy debates. I've recently testified in the House Financial Services Committee. Uh, Patrick McChair McHenry created a new digital asset subcommittee. 
I was up there uh, in f a few weeks ago, last month. I testified in the Senate Banking Committee uh, around uh, crypto regulation. And, uh, you know, it's really fascinating. It's moving quickly. The business is moving quickly. Um, and the regulatory environment is is moving uh, very quickly. So it's a lot of fun to teach, but it also can be a bit of a <laughs> bit exhausting. That's good. I think it's it's cool to be able to teach a subject. I went to law school as well, um, you know, years ago. And it's interesting. It's a rare opportunity to both be, you know, what I, what I would actually find in law school is like the, the topics that were then cutting edge at the time, you wouldn't actually get much of the meat of the legal principles because you were just learning like the thing, like the new thing, whatever it was, having nothing to do with law. Now, the topics that were most I guess like legally rich and intellectually stimulating were for at least for me stuff like criminal law, hardcore stuff that had been around for a long time. But I think something like crypto regulation, you know, crypto related law could probably be an example that bucks that trend a little bit because on one hand you do have this relatively speaking new thing, cryptocurrency, but you have old fund foundational principles of financial regulation, market regulation, etc. that apply or don't apply, but you can actually sort of roll up your sleeves and still have the intellectual richness of some of the first principles, but as applied to something different than the old banks or securities regimes that we've been talking about for forever. So yeah. long way of saying, I guess I, I would probably take that class if I were in law school right now. <laughs> uh, you know, you seem like, you know, I think our team said you did a great job with the testimony. So I'm, I'm excited to learn from you today, but that sounds like a don't be too exhausted by it. I think it actually sounds pretty cool as well. No, no, say. it's, it's you know, I, I love it. Um, you know, I wouldn't do it if I didn't love it. And, and you're right. I mean, you know, I think the reason that crypto appeals or is interesting to so many people, because it's it's been around a while now and it's and it's kind of polarizing, I've, I've sort of discovered, you know, people are either, you know, all in, love it, it's the future of money, finance, or they're kind of the Charlie Mungers of the world, right? Like, this is all, you know, nonsense. It's good for nothing but money laundering. Um, you know, the students are more just curious, right? I mean, especially law students, you know, you know, they're, they're generally risk averse, right? You know, most of them, I pull them at the start of class, like how many of you actually own crypto or used it? It's not a lot. Obviously, if I was at the business school and asked that question, like every hand would go up, right? Um, but it pulls from so many disciplines. I mean, as you mentioned, obviously financial regulation, um, but also like, you know, what is money? You know, it's forced us to kind of rethink like these questions that most people hadn't thought about, you know, in their lifetime. What is the relationship between the sovereign and money, right? I mean, it, it obviously draws on technology, cryptography, math, you know, politics. So there's kind of something in it for everyone is what I like to say. And, you know, it's, it's, it's still from a, a legal and regulatory sta standpoint, it's nascent. So I tell my students, like, listen, when you finish this class, like you are now a crypto regulatory expert. Right. And there's not a lot of them out there. And you can go to your firm or wherever you go and make an immediate impact. Um, and so I think that's what makes it so fun to teach and why I like students are just so into it. You've got my juices flowing. So I'm pretty pumped for this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit the FOMO instincts in me are right now making me feel like we might not even have enough time here. Uh, but let's get as far as we do. Uh, this is actually going to be fun. Yeah, let's do it. So, so table stakes. OK. What is a cryptocurrency? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's obviously got currency in the name. So I think yeah. that's what kind of most people think about it. You know, currency or money, you know, has, uh, you know, a technical definition. So economists like to say that, you know, money fulfills three functions, right? Medium of exchange, meaning we can use it to buy and sell goods and services. Unit of account, meaning we can use that, you know, monetary unit to compare the relative value of things. And then a store of value meaning that you feel comfortable keeping your money, your wealth in that unit. You know, crypto kind of fails, <laughs> really, in my opinion, on, on all three of those things. Um, so we can kind of get into a conceptual conversation around like, you know, why is crypto valuable? Why does it fail on number three? Actually, let's just depress on that, for example. Why wouldn't crypto be a store of value? Well, because it's too volatile. I mean, you can keep your money there, um, but it's just far too volatile to be like a useful store of value. And there's no, you know, there's... When I talk, when I talk to crypto proponents, I say like, listen, like, what is your valuation methodology, right? Like, why do you think it's, you know, because at the end of the day, any asset is worth whatever people are willing to pay for it, right? But, you know, professional investors have, you know, some type of framework they use to make a determination whether or not a given asset is overvalued or undervalued. Well, I don't, I, I, you know, I mean, I think you could say that about any currency though, right? What's the fundamental store of value in the peso? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a sovereign, you know, like there's a sovereign entity that stands behind it. So the reason that, you know, the dollar is valuable and people use it, whether or not they think about it, is that they're making an implicit judgment about the United States government and that the United States government is going to be a going concern, right? And, you know, God willing, it will be, right? Because we got deep, you know, deep problems if it's not. Um, you know, but with crypto, there's no issuer, right? So who are you trusting in? And in essence, you're trusting in math. Uh, is what you're trusting in because That's the exactly blockchain. Right. So explain how that works, right? That's what I was looking to yeah, get to. Yeah. So just... for the first time, you know, so really, crypto is, you know, what what makes it run is blockchain technology, which is a, a decentralized database. Everyone has the exact same copy of the database, and in crypto's context, let's just stick with Bitcoin to keep it simple. You know, that database records every single Bitcoin transaction in the history of Bitcoin, right? And it's fully transparent. Everyone can see it. Every computer that's running that, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain software has the exact same copy. And so what that means is that it ha it's a system that everyone can trust the contents of that ledger without having to trust any intermediary or single person. So the first time for the first time in history, we have the ability to transmit value peer to peer without the need for any third party intermediaries. And I think that aspect is what excites so many people about crypto is the ability to transact peer to peer. Now that's in theory, that's the principle behind it. That's what Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of, you know, Bitcoin, the first, you know, cryptocurrency, you know, he lays out this vision for a peer to peer payment system. Of course, as we sit here today, you know, 14 years later, the crypto economy looks very different. Right. I mean, it's littered with intermediaries, you know, because it turns out people like intermediaries, right? People don't want to have to store their money on a thumb drive in a coffee tin that's buried in their backyard. Right. I mean, because that's what it takes to kind of secure, you know, there's this adage in cryptocurrency, not your keys, not your coin, because you have a, a public address. If you want to send crypto, you need to have a public address so I know where I'm sending it to. But then you sign that transaction with your private key, simply an alphanumeric string of characters. So if you don't right. have access to that, if someone has access to that private key, then they have access to your, to your crypto. So for those reasons, people prefer to use intermediaries, right? Like crypto exchanges. And the situation we have now is that those exchanges are essentially unregulated or lightly regulated. They're not regulated to the extent that traditional securities so exchanges like Coinbase. are. So that, that, Coinbase. Yeah, so like Coinbase. Yeah. So like Coinbase, right? Um, and people like intermediaries, right? They and fulfill actually, this valuable is useful. Functions. I mean, I thought, I mean, you think you know something, but then you also recite words and you realize you didn't really understand that, you know, some of the details in between. Your point is like the, those, those passcode, you know, the 12 character containing things that you'll see crypto people carrying around that stick into their computer and allow them to log into the blockchain, right? Like, actually, how does that actually work? Because I've always only used exchanges in the limited experience I've had with crypto as well. Like, how does that actually work? Is like you, you just type it into the World Wide Web and you get there? Um, no, I mean, you have to sign your transaction. So, I mean, you basically have to, and if you're running the, you know, most people like aren't running like the full Bitcoin software on their computer, right? But yeah. if you were, you would have to access that and you would sort of enter in your private key directly into that you know, through that software interface. Now, I'm saying, like, like, just say you're, you're saying a person who wants to buy Bitcoin but not using an exchange to do or, or, or whatever, or wants to uh, transact in Bitcoin you already have but not use an exchange, yeah. you, you know, like a Coinbase type of thing to do it. You have your store of value. Like, literally, how do you access the blockchain? Like, where is it? Well, you can download it. You can go to GitHub download and download the algorithm it. from? From GitHub, which is where okay. computer, yeah. And so, and so, that, so that's what like the, the hardcore <laughs> folk do directly. Yeah, I mean the hard, the you know, again, like the the motto is like not your keys, not your coin. So like the hardcore folk are. What does that mean? What's though? Called, not self, your keys, not your coin. Like what does that yeah, mean? That basically means if someone else has access to your private key associated with your cryptocurrency digital wallet, then that's a security vulnerability. Right. Because they can just take it as their own. If they know your public address, right, then they can send a transaction to anyone. They can send a transaction to to you. I mean to themselves, right? So and we've seen this and we've seen this play out, this security vulnerability in a variety of contexts. I mean, going back to 2015, when the largest crypto exchange in the world at the time was called Mt. Gox. They were based in Japan. 
And so they were maintaining all their customers' private keys on an, you know, on an internet accessible device. So, and they had very poor security protocols. You know, a hacker got in, was able to take all the private keys, and then once they had it, they were able to drain all the cryptocurrency. Um, you know, we've seen nation states actually ramp up their activity in this space, notably North Korea. So North Korea specifically targets crypto intermediaries who have notoriously lax security protocols. And once inside, they're able to gain access to, you know, the private keys and then steal the crypto, you know, send it to an exchange in, you know, Russia or somewhere else and cash out. I mean, so there's estimates that last year alone, North Korea stole $1.7 billion worth of crypto. In North Korea, meaning people in North Korea, or you think they're state affiliated? No, no. Um, this is what's called the Lazarus Group. So it's a state sponsored. Um, it's part of the military. So it's a state, spon state sponsored. State sponsored. Korea, that's like a serious amount of money, actually. One point seven billion dollars is is a lot it's, of. It's it's. I think it's like. I mean, the last time I checked, their their annual exports were like two hundred million. I mean, it's a closed economy, right? But yeah, I mean, so you know, the UN. Because there's been some reporting coming out of, of uh, what the UN's done. And, you know, crypto last year funds up to a third of their, or cyber, um, and crypto is a big part of that, funds up to a third of their ballistic missile program. So, you know, there are real problems out there. And, you know, and this is why, um, you know, again, the hardcore crypto people would say, like, you have to self-custody your crypto. You need to keep it. Um, you know, offline, right, in some type of, you know, it could be like a hard drive that's, you know, like a thumb drive. I mean, there's special, you know, there's companies that provide these products. Um, you know, it's again, you can just write it down. I mean, it's just an alphanumeric string of characters. There's a really good book for people that are interested in crypto, and it's like a really light read. The author's name is Ben Mesrick. He wrote, you know, Burning Down the House about the MIT Blackjack Club. Yeah, I remember. I read a couple of his books, actually. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, he wrote one called... Um, Bitcoin billionaires, and it's about the Winklevoss twins, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who parlayed their um, their Facebook settlement money into uh, crypto and built the Gemini cryptocurrency exchange, which is one of the larger exchanges in the U.S. And the book talks about how when they first got when they first invested in crypto, they wrote their private key down on strip on pieces of paper. They cut those. They cut that piece of paper into like multiple strips, and then they stored those strips in physical safety deposit boxes. Like that's so. That's like the most extreme version of keeping your you know your keys secure, your crypto secure, right? Again, the average person isn't going to do that, and that's why they use exchanges like Coinbase, right, which are holding on to those keys for you. And you know when we get into like the regulatory aspects, this is one of the you know the thornier issues because crypto exchanges are fulfilling multiple functions that are normally separate in traditional securities exchanges. So one, they're the broker, right? Like they're the place you go to to place your order. Two, they're the exchange, so they're actually running like the matching engine to execute your order. Three, they're the clearing agent. Four, they're the custodian, meaning that you're keeping your crypto with them, with that, right. with that, with Coinbase. Um, five, they're often the market maker. And then six, many of these exchanges have like a venture capital arm that are investing in crypto projects that guess what? End up getting listed on that exchange because once you're listed on exchange, that provides liquidity, Which right? It's very like, different from the normal model of what an exchange is actually doing. That's a kind of an interesting multi-hat model. Yeah, there. and so, you know, like a normal exchange, right? Like I, you and I can't place, place trades directly on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. We have to go through a broker. Right. And the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ by law have to allow broker dealers in good standing to be members, right? And so, um, so that's just kind of one difference between how crypto exchanges operate and traditional securities exchanges. Can I, can I just can I just like rewind for a second before before that which is which is inter an interesting just kind of like a philosophical question where the thing that backstops the value of most currencies to borrow your you know framing of it was the sovereign. Okay, the fact that there's a sovereign nation that stands behind the value of that currency. Now the Mexican peso we can debate that, right? Is it is a bunch of drug cartels that actually run the country or which sovereign is backing that up? Let's put those 
geopolitical quips to one side. That's philosophically, at least the way this works. Whereas here, as you said, it's math that backstops it, right? It's backstopped by math, by code, by a formula. Do you think that some people would make even an argument on the theft case, right? So, so if it's not backstopped by a sovereign, if, if the U.S. doesn't, you know, the U.S. backstops the dollar, but it's not backstopping Bitcoin or pick your other favorite cryptocurrency. Is there some argument that even the property rights regime that somebody else, uh, that the U.S. would apply to protect crypto, do you think the people who are hackers would say that it's all math? So I hacked in and got your stuff because that's the rules of this road and the rules of this terrain. It's backstopped by math itself, not by a sovereign. So the rules of the sovereign, which include those property rights, don't apply. And so by definition, it's internal to the rules of crypto to say that there is no such, there can be no such thing as a data breach or theft because data breach or theft is internal to the rules of the system. You see what I'm saying a little bit? I'm not like making some argument for crypto hackers, but. No, you're, you're very, perspe very perceptive. I mean, this is, um, you know, this is an argument that's been going on in crypto from the very beginning. Oh, it has. Okay, so um, I'm not like breaking new ground here or anything. Okay. This no, is not at all. And there's been a number of, you know, there within crypto, at least, you know, high profile incidents where this has come to bear um, because there's certainly a lot of people within crypto who adopt the mantra, right? Here's another one for you. Code is law. Right. People say this stuff. I don't agree with it, but, but, but I want to, I want to take it seriously though. Yeah. So if there's a, if there's a, if there's a flaw in the code of an underlying blockchain or cryptocurrency, then you know, by definition, you're not doing anything wrong if you exploit that. Um, and, you know, sort of the, the mo I think the most high profile example of this was in 2016 when there was something called the DAO, um, DAO, it stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. It ran on the, Ether it ran on the Ethereum blockchain, which is the second most pop. The Ethereum blockchain is the sort of second most popular blockchain behind right. Bitcoin. E the native cryptocurrency from the Ethereum blockchain is Ether. Again, second most popular token behind Bitcoin. And what the DAO was, was essentially a decentralized venture capital fund um, where, you know, you bought into it. So you would send Ether to um, what's known as a smart contract address um, on the Ethereum blockchain. In return, you would get a DAO token and that DAO token entitled you to vote on various proposals that were put forth to the entire, you know, DAO token holding community. And if the, the to community voted to fund that proposal, you know, then they would release from the treasury ether to the, you know, whoever was you know, proposing this. And if it made money, then the proceeds would be distributed back, you know, proportionally. So anyway, there was a flaw in the code and someone drained all the ether, most of the ether, that had been sent Ether is to Ethereum, the, the currency. Yeah, so Ethereum. Yep. They drained the yeah, so they stole the Ethereum um, cryptocurrency associated with this project, and you know there was a real existential debate because you know Ethereum was still in its nascent stages at that point, and so people were like, well, what do we do? And obviously, folks who had money, you know, I don't want to use the word stolen, but who you know who had money, you know, had money in, and then it was gone. Um, you know, thought like, hey, like we we got to do something about this. Um, and so Vitalik Buterin himself weighed in. He's the creator of uh, the Ethereum blockchain and, and sort of, uh, I think, probably the most high profile uh, figure within crypto because we still don't know who Satoshi is. Um, and he said, like, listen, like, you know, we got to we got to make this right. Um, and the majority of, of folks in the, the Ethereum community agreed with him and they did what's known as a hard fork. So they essentially altered the blockchain code to go back in time to right before the hack happened. Um, so as if it never happened. And in so doing, they sent people a new cryptocurrency that's now called, um, well, we call that one Ether, but the original blockchain where the hack still happened is an operational, and that one's called Ethereum Classic. So you can go on Coinbase, you can go to an exchange and you can buy... It's by definition different. They changed the rules, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they changed. So they changed the rules. So the community changed. The community collectively changed the rules, but it was very acrimonious for the reasons that you said, because people were saying, "Listen, like code is law. Um, if there's a flaw, then so be it. We have to live with the consequences." Who's to say um, it's a flaw? You know, 
Yeah, exactly. Who, who's even to say it's a flaw, right? Um, so these are absolutely um, sort of the existential debates that people are having within crypto. Now, of course, for the average person, when they hear about this stuff, they're like, oh my God, this is craziness. Like, why would I ever get involved? Um, and they should, right? but if, for the, if they, if that's how they feel, right? I mean, that's perfectly a legitimate response. But yeah, I no, actually, just, sure. I, this wasn't where I expected to spend most of the time. And maybe it just, maybe we're just going to have to talk about the financial regulatory stuff another time. But like, it is, it is kind of interesting because it reminds me so much of the two facedness of, and, you know, we'll get to the Silicon Valley bank stuff, but the, the, Silicon Valley libertarian mindset of wanting non-governmental intervention in the banking system and not having, you know, regulatory constraints and capital constraints imposed on Silicon Valley Bank that's not systemically important, only to then cry to mommy that actually we are systemically important and the depositors need to be bailed out above the uninsured depositor level is something that irritated the heck out of me. And that's a Silicon Valley specific Silicon Valley bank episode. But there's like a form of that here. You know, I have conviction on my views there. This is an issue I haven't thought about for much longer than this conversation because this is, I wasn't aware of that incident, but it smells like that to me where code is law. We're in the West, we're in the wild West frontier of the sovereign backs the currency, but we're in the post national environment in which we don't want currencies that are backstopped by a nation. What are nation? Nations have laws. Laws are preconditioned for property rights. So that's a whole regime saying, no, 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 we're opting out of that. It's just code. But then when things didn't go the way you expected, that somebody else had code that you call a hack, he calls more code, that you call a flaw, he calls part of the system, Yeah, says that I actually drained your money. Somehow the people who were the code is law people go back crying to mommy just like, the Silicon Valley venture capitalists that went crying to mommy who they thought they were the cool libertarians that wanted to declare independence from. Same thing here, saying that actually the creator has to change the protocol to allow them to get their money back like according to what set of rules, like according to what principles. Well, and, I, and, I, and I'd be really curious here. It makes me almost want to ask the question of like, what was the phenotype, the human phenotype to the extent we know it of the hackers versus what was the phenotype, broadly speaking, of the people who got hacked and who lobbied effectively for their rewrite of the rules. Like, I'm just curious what the sociology around that was. Yeah, I mean, I'm not as immersed in the, like, I'm not that deeply immersed in, you know, the technological community. And I don't know if anyone actually, I mean, the nature of crypto itself is that, you know, you, it's sort of pseudo anonymous, Right. Um, so no one knows who one another is. Um, yeah. And that's by design. You only know, you know, what the, the public address is. So that's why you're not fully um, anonymous, although there are some um, cryptocurrencies that do provide, you know, greater degrees of uh, anonymity. So, you know, I don't think we'll ever know, you know, the differences in that phenotype, as you say, but you know, you're absolutely hitting on, you know, what is one of multiple ironies when it comes to to crypto because you know the truth is that you cannot code every single contingency right things go wrong things will happen disputes will arise and of course in the traditional economy right that you know the off chain world as they say um those disputes are settled in the courts yeah right um and you know, and so that's another kind of debate is, you know, how do, how can we reconcile blockchain with the courts? Are they, e is it even reconcilable? It may not be, right? It may yeah, and it may, and it may not be. And listen, you know, and obviously something like, you know, this topic is, you know, so far over the head of most judges, right? So, I mean, we're still kind of in the early stages of these, you know, of these debates, but, um, you know, things have gone wrong within crypto repeatedly. And, you know, it's like the old uh, Mike Tyson adage, right? Everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Right. Um, and when things go, you know, so you can claim to adhere to this code as law philosophy, decentralization, you know, no intermediaries. But when your money is, you know, gone, right? Like, you, you know, is there one day and it's gone the next and I won't use stolen, um, you know, then, you, you know. But maybe you it want wasn't your money in, in this world. Like, in the world of the sovereign, it's your money. But he, it's like, 
like Max Weber had this famous sort of paradox of do, do people have ideas or do the ideas pre-exist in the universe and then we just open our minds and capture them? Well, like this is like that as applied to the realm of of money, right? In the, in the sovereign world, right? People have property rights invested in money that they create. But in this other world, it seems like it was purposefully created to say that the code really is the money, if you will, and it yeah. pre-exists and you just mine and discover it. But the fact that somebody else actually, the, the rules of that code itself allowed that other person to then take it from your pocket. That's part of the Wild West. Like, this is fascinating, man. I'm just talking through this and it actually makes me think more about, you know, the case and perhaps some of the paradoxes in even the the case for crypto regulation that the crypto industry to the whatever crypto advocates or whatever embrace i'm sure other people who are immersed in this have thought about this more than me but it seems like there's a basic philosophical decision to be made do we want this entire system what do you call the uh the 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 off chain and on chain world right so, yeah. so do we want the on chain world to sort of be this parallel universe where we don't apply the conventional system of sovereign applied property rights etc courts police state backstop to filter it and like is that what we want it to be in which case that in which case the on chain world is backstopped by the very state that that recognizes the currency also created the court system that recognizes and vests those property rights like the purist in me which says, says it should be if you want it to be a parallel world guys have at it but stop complaining and using the court system if you now want that to be re-regulated what's the point of crypto well and it's not only just stop complaining and don't use the court system it's you know stop trying to integrate into the traditional financial system. Yeah, I mean, exactly. you know, right, you know, right now, I mean, so that's where the lobbying is, is happening is, oh, well, we want, yeah. you know, we want access, you know, the crypto saying, oh, well, you know, we want access to the banking system. Right. Um, you know, and going back to the first Bitcoin transaction, 2009, it included text to a times of London newspaper article with the headline chancellor on brink of second bailout, for banks, right? So the origins of crypto are in the 2008 financial crisis, and it was created to be the anecdote to that. Wait, how was that origin? Can you explain that to me? I'm not familiar with this. Yeah, so you know, you can include in any Bitcoin transaction, you know, superfluous text. Um, and so the first, so you know, the Bitcoin white paper was introduced by Sato was introduced by Satoshi to an online cryptographic message board on Halloween 2008. However, the first Bitcoin transaction didn't occur until 2009. So that transaction, that first transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain included a reference to a Times of London newspaper article about bank bailouts in the UK. And really, you know, it was techno libertarians that sort of flocked to crypto initially and sustained it. Now, obviously at this point, there are a whole, you know, there are m millions of people that are into crypto for, you know, thousands of different reasons, right? Um, but that ideological origin is, that current still runs deep through the crypto community and you're hitting on, you know, some of the kind of, cause I'm a crypto skeptic, right? Like I'm a, I'm a, you know, regulator. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, these are kind of debates, though, that even like within the crypto community, you know, have been ongoing for for quite a while. And I'm with you. I mean, listen, I wouldn't care really if, you know, we had this code as law world, you know, on chain. There was no connections to the traditional financial system, you know, let them eat themselves. Right. Um, and yeah, you know, some people are going to lose money and that's bad, but you know, like capitalism's risky, right? I mean, people lose money in the, in the stock market. But they're not losing money. They're losing crypto. Yeah. Well, yeah. They're, they're literally yeah, they're, losing crypto, right? They're, yeah. They're losing crypto, right? Whether money, or not we want to call it money. The property so they're, they're losing something up. of value. Yeah, yeah. They're losing something that is valuable to them. I'll put it that way. And someone else um, gained something of value on the other yeah, side of it. So I wouldn't, so if that's all that was happening, I really wouldn't care. And I would move on and spend my time doing something else, you know, more pleasant and enjoyable. <laughs> the problem is that that's not the world we live in. And crypto creates pretty significant negative externalities, in my opinion. So one, you can just start with um, the energy consumption and, you know, the emissions associated with that. You know, the Bitcoin blockchain 
runs on something called the proof of work consensus mechanism. Remember how I said, you know, every computer running the Bitcoin software has the exact same copy of the database? Well, how do you ha how does that happen, right? How does everyone agree? And the way they agree is through what's known as the crypto mining process, where you have select computers running a specialized variant of the Bitcoin software gathering up the most recent batch of transactions and then effectively competing to solve a puzzle that allows them to post to the broader blockchain those most recent transactions. And that solving that puzzle, that mathematical puzzle, just requires brute computing force, which, you know, to, to do that, you need, obviously, power. You need electricity. Um, so, you know, that provides, you know, and there's good and bad things about it. Obviously, the bad is the energy consumption. You know, the good is that because there's a cost associated with doing this, presumably only people that like cared about Bitcoin would incur that cost, right? It sort of keeps away people who you know, would want to do bad things, you know, just, you know, change the contents of the ledger, right? Um, so there's a cost to maintaining this. What's the benefit? Well, if you're lucky enough or have enough computing power and you solve that, you know, the most recent puzzle, um, you get rewarded with new Bitcoins, right? So that's how new Bitcoins get put into circulation. Um, so that's the incentive. So there's a cost and there's an incentive. And that's what makes this whole thing kind of work. But again, it's very energy intensive. So going back to my point, that's one negative externality. We know that crypto is being used to undermine, you know, national security. I talked about what North Korea is doing. Yeah, but, but um, to be honest with you, traditional finance is equally likely to be well, able to do a, that yeah, too, right? It's, because it's about proportions. Of but course. you can also track the transactions you know, in a crypto in a blockchain in a way that you never could with respect to actually an opaque banking system with traditional currency, right? For sure. I mean, this is like obviously bad, you know, bad actors have been using dollars for, you know, since there's been dollars. Yeah. Right. Well, also, but, 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 but dollars were not trackable on a ledger through an opaque bank, international banking system in the same way that Bitcoin or, or other blockchain based cryptocurrencies are. Right. So there's, there is a, it is a little bit of a ironic argument to make the laundering argument, you know, national security based laundering argument for at least a technology that in principle can actually trace its transactions versus one that can't. Yeah, that's that's true. So because the blockchain does provide transparency, you can trace the flow of funds. And there are blockchain analytics companies out there that do that. So, you know, TRM Labs, Chain Analysis, you know, there's a great another great book recommendation for folks that are interested in this that just came out is um, Tracers in the Dark. And it's about the rise of people tracing, you know, law enforcement and these other, you know, these analytics companies tracing illicit flows on the blockchain. The problem is, okay, we can trace it, but we need to identify, we need to tie that blockchain address to a real world identity. Okay. Right. And that's not, that's not always so easy. That identity then, that person needs to be located in a jurisdiction where we can get to them. Um, right. And when it comes to illicit transactions in crypto, at this point, it's pretty much all roads lead to Russia because we still live in a fiat currency world. It's very mm -hmm. hard to spend any large amount of crypto, right? Like you can't really, you know, buy and sell much with it. Um, so you need to cash out. Where do you cash out? You cash out at exchanges that are operating in jurisdictions that are hostile to American interests, notably Russia. And we've seen the Treasury Department in the last, you know, since the invasion of Ukraine ramp up their sanctions, sanctioning Russian-based crypto exchanges. But, you know, the issue is once you take, you know, once you sanction one, a new one sprouts up. Right. So, yes, you know, I, I kind of when people bring up, well, you know, blockchain actually helps law enforcement because it's transparent. My retort is, well, that's like saying we should give credit to the tobacco companies for creating Nicorette gum. Right. I mean, blockchain created the problem. It's a lot easier to move one hundred million dollars worth of crypto than it is to move one hundred million dollars worth of dollar bills. Right. Um, and, th and just look at ransomware. Right. Ransom every ransomware payment, every single one is cryptocurrency, principally Bitcoin. Now it's true ransomware does predate crypto, but not anywhere to the scale that we're dealing with right now. It wasn't front page. It wasn't front page news. Look at the Colonial Pipeline hat. I hear you. Right? So, so I think we have, and I think this is useful. I, I'm already officially, if you're down for it, going to declare like we're going to have a second conversation, you know, on some of the specifics. But I think here to get just the philosophical foundation down. 
your case for potentially a regulatory regime governing crypto is based on negative externalities, largely based on energy consumption and secondarily based on the fact that it facilitates bad action that you otherwise wouldn't have wanted. I personally think that the second of those is uh, debatable, and we, we, we can debate that. The first of those, I think, is also this energy consumption as inherently bad is part of a broader, what I call climate cult in the country that we have to actually potentially even question the suppositions on which that whole assumption set rests, that energy utilization <clears throat> is at all a negative externality, as long as you're paying for that energy. And I think that's a separate point that you know, we can have. But each of which have philosophically rich, you know, you know, debates in and of themselves, right? There's a lot of rabbit holes. And by the sure. way, by the way, it is fair to say that people who are mining for Bitcoin are paying for their own energy. No. Well, in some cases, there's actually government subsidies to do this. So fine. But, so, so, you know. so, so if you get the government subsidies out of it, though, that internalizing that negative externality solves that problem for you. I mean, as a justification for regulation, like one way you could just sort of not open a whole regulatory Pandora's box would be to say if you just internalize the costs of energy consumption to the people who are actually mining for it, that solves that problem and takes that justification for regulation off the table. Yes and no. I mean, it's, you know, it's energy consumption for no economic purpose. But who's to judge that, right? Because there could be an economic value to having this parallel system. You know, I mean, who's to, I mean, there's a wide range of utilization of energy. What's to say that this is a, a less worthy category than the next one? It's just a casino. I mean, crypto is it's it's just merely speculation. Fine, but a casino so, literally uses energy, and we don't say the same thing for a casino, right? So I'm just literally yeah. asking the question well, get, of making that judgment. Is well, you itself, get free drinks at the casino. You don't get free <laughs> drinks in crypto. Well, which people then drink and then drive home and then crash in cars with each other, right? You could make this argument all day long. Yeah. But but I, I would say that so, to the but extent, you're right. the, yeah, to the extent you're describing it as an externality, we could internalize yes. that externality by actually. You know, you avoid, and I, I, I don't know. I've known people in the crypto world. I'm not some person of the crypto world or anything, but I imagine that many of them, if they had the choice to say internalize the costs of your negative externalities by paying for your energy utilization, but we trade that off for like a regulatory regime that doesn't have to exist. I think there are some people in that world who I presume would say yes to that trade off, and that's at least a first oh, principles sure. clean solution. Yeah. The other negative externality is the potential for there to be some type of like system, like crypto caused financial crisis, right? Systemic risk. Yeah, but whatever, man. You could have that anyway, right? You could also have crypto mitigant. You could, and we have regulations. Now, obviously, we've seen with SVB, right? Like, ineffective in a lot of cases, right? But Or, or even creating the very conditions for the financial crises. We have none of that with, we have none of that with crypto at all. And so a lot of, you know, what I spend my time doing is saying, like, listen, like, keep crypto out of the traditional financial system, going back to its origins. If you want to be this, you know, casino off to the side where tech savvy people, you know, play, whatever, that's fine. I don't really care about that. Um, but that's not where that's not where the industry is. The industry is give us an ETF. The industry is, you know, we want to be regulated by the CFTC. The industry is give us a give us a bank account. We actually want to create our own special banks, right? That's where the industry is. I love I love this conversation because you know what's so fascinating about this? I'm going to put a bookend on this for today, and then and then we're just going to pick up where we left off uh, at some at some date, not too distant future. If you're down for you down for that, man, for sure. Yeah, this is fun. Is you in this conversation by airing, I would say, your skepticism of unregulated crypto have made a stronger case to me, or have have for me awakened more of a pro classical crypto oh. bent. Then any, I did a bad job. No, you did a great job. Then any crypto enthusiast who has been like spewing nonsense words at me for like the last two years about the future promise of the promised land of crypto, dude, it's like that did not land well with me. But understanding the cases you've made it, though you come from the other side, has actually solidified, I think, a lot of my instincts in the pure version of it. But I think here's what we might share in common. I'm going to give you a hypothesis because the last part of what you said probably aligns with what I'm about to say is I don't think the negative externality argument is actually the strong argument. And I'm going to be presumptuous here. I don't even think that's actually what is at your intuition, at the heart of your intuition. Try this one on with me because because here's where I'm at on it is if you want the actual Wild West, go have your Wild West and don't talk to us. Do your little pin keys and lose your key and you forget your passcode. Tough luck. That's the game you signed up for. Somebody hacks you. By definition, it's not a hack. 
because it's the same system. Code is law, okay? You want to play in the code is law world, have at it. And the government, the sovereigns, they ask the, in, in the direction of the sovereigns is stay out of my hair. And the bargain's got to be yes. But the flip side is the sovereign has to have the right to say, we stay out of your hair. Don't come crying to me or to my court system or to my property rights regime funded by taxpayers through the traditional financial system. Don't come crying to me when things go wrong for you either. That works for me. And I think that that's probably the original ideologues in the crypto world. And crypto is an ideology in, in this purest sense of the world. I believe in allowing that to exist peacefully on its own terms. But it's the cr effective cronyism embedded in that to say, now, now we need, actually, we, you should regulate us so that we can have access to the traditional banking system too, that creates the hypocrisy. And I don't want to, I'm not playing your psychologist here, but hearing your arguments, at least that's the more persuasive strand to me. And I think like, I could just even like watching you in this conversation. I think that's what animates you and gets you going to me, gets me going too. But it could equally be an argument for then saying, if you, what, the direction you go is saying, okay, if that's the direction you guys want to go, then welcome, <laughs> welcome to the game of being regulated. And here's what that looks like. And we'll have a separate yep. episode on what that looks like. But to me, what I would say is don't ever cross that Rubicon. In the first place, the thing we should actually have left to one side was the idea that let the alt world be the alt world. We have off chain and on chain and may the twain be held separate. And I think that, I think that that's actually something that you've done for this conversation that the, that the greatest purists in this world haven't been able to persuade me of through the front door. And this was actually quite useful. Well, I would listen, I would be fine with that world. You're right. But the Rubicon was crossed a long time ago. And so the crypto industry is doing what every, and it is an industry, yeah. is doing what every industry that's come before them has done, which is crawl to Washington, D.C. and ask for special favors, right? They totally. want subsidies, they want light touch regulation, and they want favorable taxation. And they're no different than anyone else, despite you know the claims of their technology. I'm against cronyism in all of its forms, but I believe in the purism and in in being a purist on on the on the true vision of of the original vision of what crypto and the promise of the blockchain was too. This was so useful, Lee. Great episode of the podcast. I have a feeling we're going to be doing this at least another time. So appreciate it. Man. Awesome. Thanks for having Thanks me. For the time. Appreciate it. I'm Vivek Ramaswamy, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Vivek 2024.